Welcome to Volleyball State, your look at volleyball in six rotations. Here are your hosts, Jeff Sheldon and Lincoln Arneal. Hello and welcome to Volleyball State, a look at the sport of volleyball in six rotations most of the time. Uh, we're a proud part of the Herdat Sports family, and on any given week, we are America's 6th to 11th most popular volleyball podcast. I'm Jeff Sheldon. He's Lincoln Arneal. You can reach the show on social at Volleyball Pod, on Twitter and TikTok. Uh, email the show at VolleyballState at gmail.com, and you can find this show, plus all of our past shows, wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, when in doubt, go to VolleyballState.com, and it's all there. Lincoln, long time no talk, man. How are you doing? It's good trying to find our new rhythm with this off season where we're not recording every single week. And there's weeks where I go by and Jeff leaves the state and I don't know what's going on. I don't know what's going on in your world. It's a little bit yeah. odd, but we're it's sometimes you go, season. sometimes you go down to the Florida keys for two days. And while you're on a beach, the athletic director leaves and uh, you know, just we're, we're navigating off season hiccups like that, but we, we got a good show for you today on the show. And just a little bit later, we're going to take you to Nebraska's beach season. I wasn't the only one spending time on the beach lately. Uh, Huskers wrapped up their beach season. The spring exhibition match is set and it's going to be at a, a familiar city. Plus we're nearing the midpoint of the pro volleyball Federation season. We'll check on in on the PVF and the Omaha Supernovas. But Lincoln, do you want to do you want to introduce the main event, the big ticket item we have yeah, on the show this uh, week? We are sticking with our theme on uh, our heard at shows. We are interviewing another John. This is we last month we got to interview the top of the Nebraska volleyball world of John Cook. Now we get to also a very important John, the voice of Nebraska volleyball. John Baylor is joining us today. Uh, he's in his uh, 30th year calling Nebraska volleyball. He's an institution uh, in the state and in the, in the sport, too. So we're excited to pick his brain about his journey, his uh, perception of what's been happening in the Nebraska volleyball world. So we're excited to have Lincoln. Mr. I'm sorry, man. That was, that was a typo. He's not an institution. He should be institutionalized oh, gosh, is what geez. I meant to type. <laughs> What's what we're really here today? It's more of an intervention than it is an interview. So uh, we're excited to have John on and uh, get his thoughts on Nebraska volleyball and uh, the world of uh, college athletics and 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 some supernovas. He's branching out. He's not just doing Huskers. He's doing some supernovas as well too. So we're excited to have John on today. So let's bring him on to stay onto the stage and welcome and glad you could Jimmy, join. Us. Good to see you. How yeah, you doing? Man. Fire up six to hey. eleven. My condolences to the top five teams. You guys are uh you've probably done voiceover work for at least one or two of those top five ones. Right? We hear you all over the place. Yeah. I'm just thinking they're on borrowed time. If you're six to eleven, you're climbing. But oh yeah, I did I did uh, voiceover work for Dan Meski's show. Are they is he ahead of you? Oh, I, I mean, he would probably tell you that he was. I'm, I'm not sure that you know, we haven't found a reliable rating service yet, but you know, we th we're, we're holding our own. We yeah. think. I'll say, I think your destination radio. We I mean, also done that, that broke some news. I was digging that. Yeah, we 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 were lucky to have Coach on with us. We're we're lucky to have you continue our volleyball John streak. I I do want to ask though. This is like our twenty third or twenty fourth show, I think, and we're just now getting to you. Are are you offended that it took us this long to book you as a guest? <laughs> I, I mean, we I, talked I, to Lauren uh, twice. I think for junior prom, I was a lot of people's 23rd choice, too. So this is, this is nothing new. Well, I will say, I mean, you were one of the first people to know about this when Jeff and I were having kind of our brainstorming session down in a uh, nice downtown O Street Lincoln uh, lunch establishment, too. John Baylor just strolls by and says, what are you guys talking about? You guys should have a podcast. I'm like, well... We're actually working on that. Nice. That's when we knew it was destiny, but we had to do it because we, we couldn't go back to you and say, eh, we talked about it, but we but we couldn't do it. You two seriously are founts of knowledge uh, regarding volleyball. Just the, the fact you're researching all the time, coming up with new stuff. And you got to know where to look to get information on in this sport because it's not yet covered by the mainstream sports media. So. Uh, you are one of my destinations. You always make me sound smarter. So, of course, you guys are logical uh, pioneers in this area. So I seriously listen every time and I learn stuff all the time. Well, that's that's very kind Thank of you. you to say. And we appreciate you saying that and, and appreciate you you know, contributing to this knowledge base when whether we're chatting informally off the air or are you coming on the show to, to talk about 
volleyball with us. And it's it's hard for me. I confirmed this with you earlier today. <clears throat> You've been now the Nebraska volleyball radio voice for 40 oh. years. Yeah. I mean, you know, it doesn't look a day over. You've been doing it for 40 years. But did you ever <laughs> think you'd be doing it for this long? Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. When I was in middle school, I'm like, of course, I'll probably be the 30 year. No, um, I could barely spell volleyball when it when it all started. And I wish I did start in middle school, but you guys can do the math. Uh, it was, I was approached by um, Jim Rose, who was my boss at the time at uh, KLN Radio. And he said that Bill Byrne, the fabulous athletic director of the University of Nebraska, the greatest athletic director uh, um, I've ever known. Uh, and uh, Bill said in 1993, Three, look, you guys at KLIN are doing the production, at least for football, men's and women's basketball and baseball. There's one other Husker sport that's currently being done across town at KFOR. And he said, we want you guys to have all of it. And Jim said, OK, but we got this rookie guy named John Baylor who's going to have to do those games. And Bill's like, uh, OK, I'll tell Terry Pettit. And Terry Pettit was like, uh, who's this guy? Anyway, somehow we persuaded him. But uh, that's how it all started. Did, did he have a, did, did coach Pettit have a recommendation, somebody else that he wanted behind yes, the mic to yeah, talk about it? Nearly anybody else. Yeah. He was, uh, he, he was a little suspect initially, understandably. So, I mean, my experience in volleyball was calling Cal state Dominguez Hills games on continental cable vision. And when I said I had called those games, I mean, I'd called like five of them on TV prior to moving back to Nebraska, which is where I, I grew up. And I guess when I was a student at Stanford, I attended Stanford games. I remember Wendy Rush. I remember Nancy Reno lived right next to me in my dorm. And then uh, Kim Oat. every time she got a kill, I went, oh. Mm -hmm. And then when, uh, um, oh, the fabulous uh, uh, Husker, who did the same thing. So Strander, whenever she got Alicia Ostrander, yeah. uh, who now I understand works in Congress. I remembered Kim Oden in my 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 youth when I would attend games. So I was very green at, with the sport of volleyball. Kathy Noth was the assistant coach, one of the legends of the Husker program, of course. Uh, and she uh, taught me so much. And I remember when I first started, I kept saying things like count it, count it every time there's a kill. So there's a lot of counting going on. And she pulled me over. And she said, you might want to come up with something else when there's a termination. But. Yeah, I wasn't very good right away. So Terry, uh, very reasonably, had uh, had uh, reservations. Yeah, I mean, with your kind of, there's not a lot of broadcasting of volleyball going on in those days. I mean, did you have any kind of just influences on people that you patterned yourself off of or learned from? Definitely not. I had not heard anything, and uh, so and, and at the time there really wasn't a lot of volleyball play-by-play -play, radio or television. So sometimes fans, I mean, on infrequently, but occasionally they'd say, Hey, you do a great job. And I, I'd say, how would you know? I mean, <laughs> I've, <laughs> there's no, there's nothing else. Uh, but um, I, 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 I do say that I don't listen to a lot of other people because I, I don't want to get into any other habits, but I do acknowledge when I hear really good play-by-play, -play, I know what it is, but it's not like I grew up listening to Vin Scully. I mean, I listened to some Red Sox. I listened to some Bruins. Um, I grew up in Boston and, and, and Nebraska. But I mean, I, I didn't spend a ton of time listening to, to sports on the radio, even as a kid. I think I remember listening to Jack Buck and Hank Stram doing Monday Night Football uh, after my mom wouldn't, would tell me I had to go to sleep. But I, I pull my little my cassette uh, radio into my bed and underneath I'd, I'd listen to Hank Stram and uh, Joe uh, Jack Buck. But um, anyway, I, I, you know, I don't really have a lot of role models for the other sports that I that I call. And I certainly, even if I wanted to have role models for volleyball at the time, I uh, couldn't find a lot. But certainly there are plenty do it very, very well right now. Any, any Johnny Most influence in there, too? I mean Johnny Most. Oh, what am I thinking? Of course. All righty. Big Red's got it down low. Back up top <laughs> to Larry over to Kevin. He gets knocked down. You're, you're too oh, much of a health conscious person to smoke the 57 <laughs> cigarettes a day you would have needed to approach Johnny Most's voice. Oh, Johnny I just Most. don't see it working out for you. Oh my gosh. It's a good point. I like to eat healthy and I don't smoke, but Johnny Most, oh, so beloved. And he was the voice of the Boston Celtics on the radio. And gentlemen, he really represented that town, the hard scrabble immigrant town that Boston really was and to some extent remains. And then you'd play the Lakers and you got Chick Hearn, who's like Hollywood looking good. And Pat Riley was this color guy for a while before he was named assistant coach of the head coach. I mean, it, it's even the announcers 
you know, personify the distinctions between those two cities and that great rivalry. It's, oh, God, growing up in Boston, that's such a great point. When Johnny Most was was on, man, everybody was listening. He was so biased. He was the <laughs> ultimate homer. And, and uh, hey, that's right. He may be a bigger homer than even I am uh, when he, he was on Celtics game. It was close, he, though. You know what Nebraska's connection to Lakers broadcast now is, is the great Stu Lance is the color broadcaster on, on Lakers TV broadcast. Mm-hmm. And he's got his number retired um, as a former Husker great player. So yeah. I always like to slip that in um, when we can. You know, you mentioned that story with, with Kathy Noth a little bit ago about, you know, the, the count it. And, you know, how are you supposed to know how to call volleyball on TV or radio when hardly anyone else was doing it? And I think, People have kind of come to know you and your your quips and your witticisms when you're calling a match. But you kind of had to, it feels like, invent the lexicon of how to describe volleyball over the radio on, on the air. Did you recognize in the early going that that was kind of a responsibility that you were you were starting from scratch? Or did you try to pattern it after a different sport at all? Oh, well, there was a predecessor I had who I understand did a fabulous job. Um, and Harvey Watson, I believe is his name. And I didn't listen to him, but he... He preceded me, so I don't want to pretend I'm the pioneer. But, um, yeah, I didn't really have examples other than I know that um, I get frustrated as a listener when I don't I'm not able to picture the action geographically. And so uh, I think with volleyball, I immediately recognize, okay, I got to be able to say right, left, back or else the listener has no idea what's going on. And the other thing I quickly realize is nobody knows who the libero on Georgia tech, nobody knows the, you know, the, the outside hitter on Kansas. So the, what's most important is you got to give the name of the team in possession of the volleyball first, and then you got to make sure ideally you get the location and then the name of the final attack. Anything beyond that uh, is, is gravy. So unless it's ground ball to Jeter, I mean, you gotta say, what team? Where are we talking about? Because nobody knows uh, uh, when they're when they're tuning out on the radio. So I like to think that that was sort of an immediate intuition I had. But beyond that, the lexicon that I think you're suggesting, the, the way I call it now, that evolved over a long time. My guess is if you listen to what I did 15 years ago, it'd be quite different than what I do now. Well, the sports like. The sport has changed a little bit that it it seems like it's faster. If you go on YouTube and you watch a match from the early mm-hmm. 90s or the late 80s, just the tempo of the sport is faster. There's more power. There's more back row attacks. And, and you know, it's a it's a sport that you got to have a quick you have to have a quick tongue to describe. Like, and do you feel that at times that that like you just yeah. need to you need to be in an extra gear just to call matches today? Yeah, yeah. You got to be pumped up. I would not be speaking at this pace if I were calling it a game right now, you're on a very short leash, not just during the live action, but between the points, especially if you're calling a pro volleyball federation uh, match. So there's not a lot of uh, time, but what's, what's immediately obvious as well to anyone who's called the sport is you cannot call each touch. So when everyone's, anyone says, how do you do it? I just say editing. You've got to edit. <laughs> you've got to prioritize, mm-hmm. which is probably a better way to, I, I always describe it as edit. So you've got to decide, What's most important? What's most important is, okay, where is the ball and who attacked it? And then if you can get first contact, that's a bonus. Or dug back row, that's typically fine because you often don't have time to throw in names because, again, most of the – unless they're Husker fans and it's a Husker, they're not Mm -hmm. really sure who this person is. So the other thing um, I'll throw out there uh, is a lot of unsolicited suggestions for, you know, younger people in this profession is – especially when they're collegians and maybe it's a female thing, maybe if you're calling women, but I just think it's so important to call both names. I always say first and last name, Harper Murray, you know, Bergen Riley, Bergen Riley's got it. Or else, you know, occasionally if I don't have time, I'll just give the first name if it's a Husker because the fans, I think they like that. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, Anyway, when I, when I listen to games, it's all last names. And again, Lakers Celtics, we probably don't need Kobe Bryant. We probably know whom we're talking about. Okay. But a college game, I just think it's really nice. These are 19-year-olds, and you give their full name. And it, I think it humanizes it. It personifies it. So that's another thing I've always tried to do. It takes twice as much prep because, trust me, when you get that first name wrong, you hear about it really quickly. <laughs> For sure. For sure. I mean, you you kind of talk, brought up basketball. I mean, you're a diehard Celtics fan and hate the Lakers. That I mean, it, basketball is also – 
action wise, it seems like it's a sport that's most like volleyball. It's back and forth, back and forth, nonstop. I mean, there's occasional breaks. I mean, it, do you think you pattern your calls after Ooh. basketball at all? I, I do think there are similar rhythms, Lincoln. And what I like to say is volleyball is a basketball uh, moment with a slam dunk as, as the final point on uh, most of the time. Mm-hmm. So it's like if you've got basketball back and forth basketball game with a slam dunk going on, that's what gives it so much of its excitement. But you're right. There are similar cadences, rhythm, speed that that uh, you you pick up. But um, it, the way the drama builds in the sport, the proximity of the players, um, it, it's there are a lot of uh, uh, similarities. The way everything's a fresh point, the way that you always have a chance Um like there's no clock. You're not going to run out of time. I mean, there's just a lot of attributes that really lend itself to uh, the game that, you know, the world is really starting to fully embrace. You know, I, we should be honest with the audience that we did not prep you for for this. We didn't send you a list of questions um, in advance. So I'm sorry if, if some of this feels like putting you on the spot, but I feel like this is some of the stuff that we talk about when we're just sitting around, maybe yeah. enjoying a beverage and 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 talking about the sport. But over, over your 30 years, do you have a favorite match or a favorite handful mm-hmm. of matches that you can yeah. recall being a part of? I do. Um, I think, uh, you know, everyone knows the 2017 national semifinal against Penn State when they had the match point and they tripped over each other and the Huskers mm-hmm. ultimately come back and win. Um, uh, that's right there in the conversation. But some of uh, the, the, you know, the 2016 uh, regional semi when it's the 11 a.m. start. Mm-hmm. Huskers are the number one seed, defending champs, and then Penn State comes in. All their great players are juniors that year, and they've got the Huskers two love, and they've got two match point chances, and the Huskers win those two points. And in the in in about 90 seconds, that whole match turns, and the Huskers steamroll them in the last two sets. Those are matches that probably a lot of fans uh, who are maybe late to the the Husker volleyball mm-hmm. party. But some games that I re- remember that are often forgotten are the 1995 National Semi, Michigan State. That was a phenomenal match. You know, Jenna Robel, Val Sturk for Michigan State, Chuck Irby's the head coach, Christy Johnson, one of the great matches I've ever seen where the Huskers just, Christy primarily willed themselves to victory. And then, you know, almost the somewhat anticlimactic national championship win uh, two days later over, over Texas. That Michigan State's one of the great matches. But I love the comebacks. So, you know, 2008, the regional final at Seattle, when we're having, <laughs> we're having connection problems. So not only had most people gone to bed, it's probably a good thing because they'd given up the, on the Huskers because my championship call that, or the, 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 the final point call got, you know, cut off, you know, the connection wasn't good. And somebody back, pulled like the phone jack out of the wall you know, or something. Who knows the, the, the back then the, you know, the technology wasn't nearly as, uh, it wasn't even close. Does it sound as it's the, yeah, they, it makes today's technology makes the announcer sound so much better. But then um, in 2000, Nebraska is undefeated and it's the second round and South Carolina is at the Coliseum. That Cali- was the night that Eric Crouch won the Heisman, I think. You might be right. Um, and Kelly Plummer was throwing, you know, firing lasers from the right side for South Carolina and it was the old side out scoring and South Carolina had Nebraska 14, 11, first to 15, win by two, um, 14, 11 in the fourth up two sets to one undefeated season, totally in the balance. You, you could forget about, you could not hear yourself think, um, that's beyond the point. That's beside that was, that, that was self-evident for anyone there that night. But the players tell me is they would get up to each other face to face and yell and they couldn't hear each other. That's the crescendo that the Coliseum created that night and the fans willed the Huskers on and then ultimately they win the title uh, undefeated that year. Those are some of the great moments where the great comebacks, the Seattle comeback, the South Carolina comeback that uh, inspire me, that inspire us, that, that, uh, that make us so grateful. We've had this, you know, front row seat, this box seat all these years to the greatest show on Terraflex. How, uh, how long does it take you to come down from those matches? Are you still, <laughs> living or are, are you kind of i mean are, like hours after the match i mean are you staying up with match ends at 10 o'clock are you up till 3 4 a.m how how long does it take yeah. you to come down after those yeah. matches? i'm the last guy in the bar talking to the janitor hey man let me talk to you about set three no um yeah it takes a while to uh come down yeah i <clears throat> i don't get to bed 
or fall asleep uh, very early on nights like that. And it's amazing, guys, how it remains fresh. Like, sure, I've felt this before. I've sensed this before dozens and dozens of times. These are the great classic matches I'm talking about. But like, they're always amazing and they're always building. And here we go in a set five and we're in the postseason. It's like, it's just, there's very little uh, like it. And if you're there and you can feel it, you know what I'm talking about. And it's this shared community. You know, I, I like to say, hey, we're we're, you know, we're at the, uh, the vanny, it's a doggone mixer. If you came here single, not for long. I mean, it's, it's like, it's just, there's just, everyone is part of this, this huge growing family that, uh, you know, felt like a pretty big family 20 years ago. And it's, it's, uh, you know, uh, exponentially larger now. So sure. yeah, it's, uh, it's something it that doesn't, um, allow, you know, early to bed, early to rise after a big one. Yeah. In over your 30 years, you've been to many different arenas, uh, seen a lot of different matches too. I mean, what are your favorite places to go to call a game? I mean, we'll, we'll leave the Devaney, the Coliseum out of this just because I think that's an environment unlike any of But when you're on the road, what are your favorite places to go? Like either it's the setup, either it's the environment, where do you like to call matches? I love Rec Hall at Penn State. All the students are right there. It's always whiteout night for some reason at the Penn no. State home matches. And they're, the students are so into it. Probably the best place is Wisconsin. I mean, it was Wisconsin Fieldhouse. I mean, that's kind of been a, uh, you know, a, a house of horrors for Nebraska volleyball the last six or seven years. But it's, it's always uh, electric in there. Fans are going crazy. I wish they'd finally allow fans in the upper deck. Maybe someone listening could advise us why they won't allow fans in the upper deck anymore up there. I heard fire codes. I heard, I'm not sure what the deal is, but imagine integrity. Excellent. And now on one end, they're, they're putting up some, some boxes, some corporate boxes. So that, that is going to be um, available, I think in the near future. Anyway, I, as amazing as that place is with what I think they, they, they get 8,000 in the lower bowl. Imagine if they filled the upper, yeah. um, that's a great, and they used to, by the way, um, fill the upper bowl. So, I love those old courts, wooden floors, old buildings, mining the old Coliseum. Um, you know, Gregory Gym down in Texas is another place uh, like that. And that place gets loud. It's kind of connected to a rec center. So it's not quite yeah. a standalone facility that um, Rec Hall and, and University Fieldhouse, uh, old Wisconsin Fieldhouse are. But uh, those are some of my special. When, when I get to say they're scratching their backs on the bricks, uh, <laughs> I like those. I like those field houses. You know, I was actually in the Coliseum last weekend with my family. We they have a lot of campus events on there, and it, it, it the the Coliseum is just connected to the University of Nebraska Rec Center. So you got kids playing badminton and basketball a hallway away from where you know the best volleyball program in the country used to play. It made me wonder. We, we spend all this time looking for where they're going to play spring matches. Do you think once a year they would they would do well to just go back in the Coliseum and play one match a year there, whether it's a regular season match or a spring exhibition? Because there are other schools that do that. Penn State played a basketball game in Rec Hall late in the regular season, and you can do it as like throwback night with old graphics and throwback uniforms and things like that. That would be fabulous. Two problems. One is how do you get those North Stadium uh, bleachers back up there. Yeah. I don't know. I think that's yeah. long been destroyed. Um, secondly, how do you get the lower? All the lower seats are a question mark. Uh, secondly, is you know the um, the spring game guys has become this uh, thank you to small town Nebraska, and I think small town Nebraska or, or not so small town Nebraska. Kent Carney, for example, where mm -hmm. on May 4, the Huskers are going to play Denver and Megan Pendergast, um, uh, would, would feel a little hurt, you know? I mean, but why you don't have to just play one. Yeah. You can play a couple games. That would be pretty cool. You know what? Coach Cook, he says he listens. I heard in the interview last week. <laughs> would that be a pretty cool swan song? To have one more match at the Coliseum. Bring I think you could do it in. like an early season non-conference match. And I know you lose out on some revenue that you get from, from the size at the Devaney. But how cool would that be if you put the bleachers back up on that north side one last time and you put 4,100 in the Coliseum uh, against, uh, I don't know, like, you know, Missouri State or whoever you're going to fill out one of your non-conference weekends with. I think that would be a super cool and, thing to and do. And let the Huskers experience the old Coliseum locker room. Enough of this cherry wood and mahogany. Let's get back to basics. 
yeah, this guy, you, you got to Rocky for this and go up into the mountains and start <laughs> running up the hill. You know, so the many player, we, we the players running through the hay market, you know, tossing oranges at the fruit stands and, and <laughs> getting ready for the game. I love it. A, a lot of the conversation around Nebraska volleyball revolves around the individual personalities that make up the program. And, and a lot of times people obviously gravitate to stars. And this program has had no shortage of stars and Olympians and all Americans that have come through um, the De Coliseum and the Devaney Center. But I remember you and I have talked a lot about um, some of your favorite players have been maybe those glue players that have not been as heralded, um, haven't earned all America honors, but were still really important parts of teams. Do you have one or two kind of Holy favorite, shit. I guess I will call it underrated Huskers that some of even the oh. newer fans that are listening to us might not be as familiar with? Well, I, I love Alicia Ostrander for what she represents. Every time she'd go in, I'd say, listenership in Gordon, Nebraska, just skyrocketed. Um, and uh, she just, she waited her turn and she never totally got it, but she was a captain at the end. And now I understand she's a, doing fabulous professionally. But I'll tell you two of my candidates for most important Huskers. These aren't the greatest Huskers. These are what I would consider the most important Huskers. Without their arrival, the team slips. All right. So without their mm -hmm. arrival, the team slips. So I'd say Megan Corver back in 1996, if she doesn't transfer from George Washington, that team drops a little bit. And then the second one is Sydney Anderson, 2008. I mean, Caleb Banworth was starting to train as a setter. And this is Jordan Larson's senior year. Can you imagine Jordan Larson without an elite setter? Yeah. One of the greatest players of all time, literally. And doesn't have anyone to feed her the volleyball. And Sydney arrives on a white horse and that team uh, beats yeah. Washington in this best, greatest comeback ever. So they're probably the two most important, but, you know, there's there's nothing like Jordan Larson and Michaela Fecky. I mean, just saying their names, mm -hmm. uh, just, just remembering what they accomplished. Michaela Fecky, what she did from 15 to 18 is um, – is, is, difficult to describe in words because when she arrived, things were not going great for Nebraska volleyball and she and Kenzie Maloney and, and a Richard sophomore named Kelly Hunter just blew some fresh wind through the hallways of Nebraska volleyball. And they came in with this attitude and they came in with this skill set and uh, everything changed. And we're now in the, what, the 10th year of the golden age of Nebraska volleyball coming up uh, starting back in 2015. Think of 2018, Michaela's senior, senior season. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of stuff we talk about over a beverage, but maybe the fans will enjoy this. Think of who was on that Nebraska lineup. You had a red shirt sophomore in the middle, uh, Lauren Stiverns. You had Lexi Sun on the outside, her best season. She was a true uh, sophomore. On the right, we had Jazz Sweet, all righty, uh, who was the number 12 recruit in the country. And uh, she had already won a title the, the year before. Um, our, we had Callie Schwarzenbach as a starting middle. Okay, mm -hmm. Callie, fabulous person, but not exactly an offensive juggernaut. Okay, mm -hmm. she could block. But, and we had a true freshman setter named Nicklin Hames. Mm -hmm. That team takes one of the greatest collections of talent at this level in the history of the sport, Stanford, to 9-9 nine, nine in the fifth in the championship match. Like, that's Michaela Fecky. She had, it's what, like, 27, 28, 29 kills in that match? It wasn't quite 30, I remember, but she did everything she could to, to oh. drag them to that. And and if they get, you know, even an average, you know, a, a B-minus Lexi Sun match, they probably win the title. Yeah. And we got an A match from Lexi in the national semi against Illinois when Illinois had two match points in the third set. We got She had 19 kills in the national semi, didn't have a great match in the championship, but you're absolutely right, Jeff. The idea that that team was on the precipice of a national championship, it's just, that's Michaela Fecky. And basically, bump set the Fecky, jump set the Fecky. Fecky's on the right. She just, mm -hmm. they're setting her in the concourse because no one had any answers for her, and she was so humble. You'd bump into her at a coffee shop, fans around her. She's just got time for everybody. She's literally holding babies, taking photos of people. <laughs> I mean, that, she's, she's special. If the Supernovas could get Michaela to come back, could get Jordan to play for them, uh, the 12,090, the record setting crowd we saw the other night, uh, that's that's yeah. going to get broken. For sure. For sure. Well, cool. Well, we're going to switch focus and get out of the history and talk about more recent history, too. I mean, this year, this past year was record breaking for 
many different ways too. But I mean, have you ever seen anything comparable to volleyball day in Nebraska too? Or, or do you ever mean think that you'd get to call a volleyball match in Memorial stadium? Gentlemen, that's a tough one for me because I was going through, um, uh, very serious personal grieving um, on that day. So whenever I get asked about it, I always get a little emotional. But um, I'm so glad I was there. I'm so glad I um, was able to call it. It was one of my worst performances probably ever. And it was too bad because it was on a big stage. Uh, but uh, it, it, uh, it, looking back at it now a little more um, objectively, I, I moved by it for other reasons. And um, no, I, I never dreamed I could be part of that. And friends from all over the country uh, um, who barely know I call Nebraska, but I kind of have heard of it and um, now think it's a big deal and ask, were you calling that game? I'm like, well, it was on the radio. That's kind of what I do. Um, so uh, <clears throat> uh, it was uh, it was a great it was an honor to be a part of it. Uh, the idea that the, the program would do it is pretty remarkable. The fact that we didn't think it was that remarkable beforehand shows you really what their brand is. That, you know, we've been talking about them playing at Memorial Stadium for years, but then the idea that they would do it and succeed at it and really send a message to the world about, you know, what's possible when you just give people a chance um, uh, is, is uh, that's Nebraska and that's Nebraska uh, athletics. And so that's, that's the gift that game just keeps on giving because I don't think anytime soon people are going to forget that there were 92,003 at a volleyball match. And every time I meet someone, they'll say, I was there. And I'm like, how many? <laughs> I brought my whole family of four. I'm like, without you, we don't break 92,000. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's that difference. I mean, you mentioned a little bit too. I mean, there was a very unfortunate accident you're involving your brother. Unfortunately, he passed away because of that. And that happened right at the beginning of the volleyball season. How difficult was that for you? I mean, during the, your busiest time of the year with volleyball too, I mean, how, how how did you handle that and kind of, like you said, grieve through that? Oh, um, not well, not well. Um, that was, uh, that will always be, um, a great, great sadness and loss, not just for me, but for so many people who, who love yeah. my brother and the way it happened and when it happened. Um, I'm, I'm grateful for all the support I continue to get. Um, and it's not just for me, it's all my siblings, um, my children. Uh, as he was a, a, a very big part of our lives. I saw him every day. He, he knew so many people around town and he loved the Huskers and he would have been so excited about this past journey, this, this past season, and then all the success the basketball teams are having. So it's just the, the tragedy that just I keep being reminded of. And it's OK, because I've, le I've learned that everybody has tragedies like this. They're just not quite so public. And so um, uh, but Lincoln, it was it was uh, really tough. And um, I. I, I think this is the first time I've ever kind of talked about it uh, publicly, at least. And um, my goal was not to insert myself in any of um, what was happening, this amazing journey. And um, and I'm so grateful for the team for not only how they cut me some slack, but uh, really embraced me and did all sorts of kind things for me uh, during that period of time. And then just happened to take me on this great magic carpet ride called the 2020 uh three season, which helped immeasurably in, in my ability to, to, to grieve, but uh, grief is something that everyone does differently. And, uh, and uh, this is no exception. And I, um, uh, I, I will probably never get over this, but I will certainly do my best to get through it. And I think I'm doing okay, but the timing could have not have been more difficult. Although I don't think any timing for something like that is, yeah. is uh, easy. It's unfortunate. I, didn't, I had a couple of opportunities to meet your brother and he's a wonderful human being. And it was just, it was great to see you two interact kind of, you bring him along to our post match meetups and just, he was there and involved in the conversation and big part of your lives too. And uh, he was a wonderful human being and very sad to see him go, but I appreciate you sharing him with the volleyball community the way that you did. So it was great to get to do that. And I hope the, the, the grieving process and the healing process continues. for you. Thank you, Jimbo. 
He was a good one. Yeah. He'd call him after every game. And I go, uh, and we'd have, we'd have, uh, anyway, he, he loved the Huskers. We'd go to football games, basketball games. He, he loved women's basketball games. That was, uh, kind of his thing. And, um, he certainly loved Nebraska volleyball and he, uh, he, uh, he, he missed a pretty good season, but I hope he was watching. One of the other things that volleyball day in Nebraska kind of reminds me, um, or, or stands out because, you know, there was so much attention around it nationally. You've had the Big Ten Network is doing like big time documentary stuff on it. You and Lincoln and I have all kind of been a part of of some stuff in the past, whether it was NET putting together documentaries. The, the things that we have seen this program do and, and ha- the popularity it has for 20 or 30 years, it seems like it's being exposed to a, an even wider audience now. And, and John Cook told us that SPN might be looking at doing a, a thing on, on Nebraska volleyball. Do you keep coming back, getting approached, John, about sort of being a, I don't know, a, a historic a historian of Nebraska volleyball. Do, did you ever, you know, envision this program getting to a point where, it would need historians. It would <laughs> it would be popular to the level that we're seeing it, and it would also be a leader in in a real moment that we're having, where women's sports popularity and exposure is just kind of exploding yeah. across the country, and that you know our little corner of the world sort of has a has a big role to play in that. Uh, the answer to your question is no, but I think about how NFL films and. You know what we used to watch as kids the the, the old films of the, the nfl games has really been quite a potent foundation for the popularity of football today the the sense of history the you know where this came from and you know how all of this occurred well with volleyball with the video that we have and the and the audio we have and those who are very much still a part of it and witness so much of it uh, we've got that connection and that adds to the gravitas of it and i and uh um, some, I think there's, there's no lack of appetite for learning, you know, how this all occurred in the humble beginnings where, whether it's John Mabry's fabulous first of two books on the history of Nebraska volleyball or the other books that have been written on Nebraska volleyball. So I think that adds texture dimension to the appreciation for what we have here. And, uh, this is not just some pop-up, you know, um, uh, Instagram thing. I mean, this is something with real roots where people started from scratch. And what we enjoy today, I like to say, is just what's possible with good old fashioned Nebraska daily hard work, uh, which over time really pays off. Yeah. Yeah. That's the cool thing, too. I think that the docu- the document documentaries have done a good job of illustrating how this is, it started when Terry Pettit was out there handing out flyers, tickets to get people to come to that. And I think, and I think the radio broadcast also plays a big part in that. And it being the Husker radio network is very expansive. I mean, we heard a lot this year about how TV numbers were setting new records. I mean, do you see the radio numbers? Is that illustrated on that side too? Or is your audience growing mm-hmm. larger? I, I did hear, and I should know this better that, um, our games are like second highest right behind football. And then there was a game actually on television, which got better TV yeah. ratings that day than the Husker football game that day. I mean, those are just moments in time. Of course, football is so much bigger in revenue and fan base than, than volleyball, but it's pretty remarkable how volleyball is really uh, skyrocketing and even on the radio. Cause there you can, uh, when at least online streaming, you can quantify the, the number of listeners and it's just, in the five figures all the time, um, yeah. at least. And for big matches, I believe it, it dips up into the um, six figures. And that's just streaming. Forget about the 23 radio stations. Now, for those of you who like history, we used to be on a single station when I started. It was KLN Radio, which is 1,000 watt AM at night. Whoosh, would, would go down in size. Allison Weston came from Papillion. They named a road after her. She was a former National Player of the Year for 1995. Her parents for road games would drive to the Waverly exit 50 miles west on the outskirts of Lincoln's and sit in their car with the engine on to listen to the road games because you could because you couldn't hear them beyond the radius, really, uh, the outskirts of Lincoln, Nebraska. That's where it began. Now you've got 23 radio stations, plus, of course, the Internet. And we reach everywhere. The Westons do not have to leave their home anymore. 
Well, you tell that the powers that be at the Husker Sports Network recognize, you know, the, the quality of the broadcast and the popularity because you you expanded this year from, I believe the pregame show used to be a half hour leading up to the match. And now it's an hour leading up to the match, which provides them a lot of valuable inventory. I mean, it's extra work for you. Did did the, the way that the broadcast has kind of mm-hmm. changed technologically over the last couple of years present a lot of challenges to you and Lauren? no. Oh, uh, I, I think I know what you're saying now, but as far as adding extra half hour, that wasn't a, a huge challenge. Although sometimes I think, am I going to have to start talking about my middle school hobbies here to fill this <laughs> elongated pregame show? Can you imagine that? A college volleyball match. We had an hour long pregame because we have so much advertising dis- appetite. Mm-hmm. We've got to create more inventory. for, And it sells out like that every year. And I'm thinking... So uh, maybe a 90 minute pregame yeah. uh, to, to pull year. back the curtain for people who haven't been in the, the radio industry or media industry. The length of your pregame show is, is directly it corresponds to how much advertising you can sell, because that's really all it is. It's the inventory for advertisers. That's why the Husker football broadcast have a five hour pregame show is because <laughs> a lot of advertisers want to buy time in the broadcast. So that's actually a real, you know, it's a mm-hmm. kudos to the job you and Lauren do that you got doubled the the amount of pregame show and it kept all the, the ad sales people happy. Yeah. And, but between those ads, there are a lot of nuggets and there's a lot of great information you don't want to miss or the game starts. You're like, I don't even know what's going on here. Yeah. And how are we going to know, pre-game. how yeah. are we going to know what the piccolo players talking about or what their, what their routine is? That was one of the highlights of the past year for me was the interview with the uh, Molly, the piccolo player. Molly, the piccolo player. Yeah. You're a celebrity. Is this is what happened. Coach cook was getting on the, uh, Husker Express pep band and saying we need to add a couple tunes and Molly heard that and so she's tweeting me they got this new technology like Twitter and stuff <laughs> you can start anyway uh so we uh I just said well come on up here and let's talk about it so she gets up there and she went to Omaha Scott she's majoring in music she wants to be a music teacher and I'm like this is what gives me hope and so uh the pregame show it's it's a potpourri I mean it's a it's a, it's a cornucopia of information, knowledge, you know, factoids. You never do know who's going to uh, show up uh, uh, next. But um, as far as technology, I think this is no secret anymore. Lauren is not usually with me. She mm-hmm. is living out uh, in western Wyoming, and she goes to a great Internet connection and watches on a screen, and I'm there at the match, and on occasion, we'll step on each other because there's a micro delay. But usually people say they cannot tell. Right. Yeah, she, we, one of the first times we or the first time we talked to Lauren on the show, she got into all the ins and outs of the the remote broadcast. So we're not we're not telling any tales. OK, cool there. <laughs> anyway, I think it's great. Um, we have such a fun time. I've been doing it with her for now, like eight years. And um, I I, we, I, I, I love doing games uh, with, with Lauren and she's, she is pretty remarkable. I mean, I've heard from people that uh, one person, frankly, who's like an old time broadcaster who says, you know, you really shouldn't have an insider on the broadcast because there's they're such a conflict of interest. And with Lauren, she's tougher on the team than anybody would be. And then she's able to ask questions of the head coach that we all want answered. And then I've got to kind of like try to settle things down up there. Like, look, we don't want any family <laughs> friction up here, but we do want to hear some answers. But I mean, yeah. one day, you know, for, you know, one moment she's talking about, you know, fashion player fashion. The next moment she's Mike Wallace. I mean, I love it. So it's, <laughs> I mean, people love that post game because they know they're going to get pointed questions. Thanks to Lauren. Yeah. Yeah, it's different with the insiders, the daughter, and the daughter's not afraid to call out the coach for uh, oh. any, Ill, any perceived uh, things they're doing wrong. Seriously, she has really forged a unique broadcasting style that I admire so much. Like, she just has her own way of just having fun, enjoying what's going on, laughing, cracking jokes, and then being quite candid at the same time. So you get this fabulous sort of relaxed, but yet, pointed informational uh, style that I think it'd be very tough to replicate, even if you are related to you know, the head coach. So it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, uh, it's, we, we've, uh, we have a lot of fun. I really Great. enjoy doing the games. Okay. Great. we got John Bailey, just a couple more questions for you and we'll let you get on with your day. Uh, but we've talked a lot about the past, a lot about the past. Look, I mean, Nebraska is coming off of a national runner up finish what excites you about the volleyball season this fall? 
Oh, the talent coming back, the uh, focus and desire they're going to clearly have after the way the season ended, um, and just the insatiable um, uh, hunger for the return of Husker volleyball across the state. I mean, it's now a 12-month-a-year enterprise where everyone's talking about it, at least in my orbit. And maybe mm-hmm. that's a little skewed because I'm connected but it's we are just, doing a podcast about it in March. <laughs> yeah. It's 20, it's 12 months a year. I mean, everyone's into, yeah, we're in great point. Um, so we just got to make sure our outsides can pass this year. That's the, that's the big thing. We, you guys know better than I, that's, and, and the Nebraska volleyball, there's most players get better. And I mean, you know, every team, every player gets better over their career at Nebraska, which, I hope we'll persuade more of them to stay throughout their career because you stick around, you get better in this system. All those tough practices, it's amazing how suddenly when you're done, you not only have all sorts of act, personal accolades and team accomplishments, but you probably got a lot of pro offers and maybe an Olympic offer, a uh, national team offer as well, because you get really good over these um, four years. And uh, we had a really young team and they were, um, you know, a little exposed uh, uh, by the end and, uh, it'll be really fun to see how much better they can be. And it's, you know, they only lost two matches. So there's not a lot of improvement, but there's, mm-hmm. you know, those two matches are pretty big. You, you have to think that Nebraska is going to be the the favorites to win the big 10 um, going to next year. I don't, I don't know who else. Wisconsin? Would be. Well, Wisconsin, you know, I think has to replace some people, don't they? They got Sarah Franklin back. Whenever you got her, you're in the battle. You, you got a chance. Yeah. It'll, yeah. Okay. Wisconsin, Nebraska, again, kind of neck and neck, most likely. And then there will be a dark horse team. Like it's weird to call Penn State a dark horse um, <laughs> based on their history, but I think Penn State's going to be really good um, again this year, especially if their freshman setter ends up being anywhere close to what her what her mm-hmm. accolades are. I do want to switch gears just real quick at the end here to, to talk about that we have a professional league in the U.S. now, and by this time next year we'll have two professional leagues in the U S and you get a great seat for the Omaha supernovas. Now you've been doing some matches on, on news channel, Nebraska. I'm really impressed with the job that Nancy Metcalf does um, as your, as your color commentating partner too. just what's been your thoughts about the first season of the supernovas and, and kind of seeing what professional volleyball is like as it unfolds now, right in front of you here in Nebraska. I'm just, uh, marvel at the quality of the play i just i mean we're seeing shots that in this country we don't normally see because now these former great domestic players are now 24 25 26 32 33 and they just bring a lot more heat and the defense is up to the task it's amazing these rallies that get dug um the fan base in omaha i guess i shouldn't be surprised but we're getting more than twelve thousand for for saturday night games and the energy in there they all sang sweet caroline the other night it felt like seventh inning it's Fenway I mean it was awesome and people are into it I'm told that the uh, merchandise sales is stunning I mean they do huge merchandise I went to the the post office today and one of the mailmen was wearing a Supernova's hat just an hour ago it's there as everywhere I think their front office people really knew what they were doing and and capitalized on this and did a really good job didn't let this opportunity go away yeah it's it's cool and and, uh, they're already they're already calling it Nova Nation Oh. Or maybe I'm calling it Nova Nation. But anyway. <laughs> They're going to get sued by PBS. It feels like it. It feels like it. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Good point. <laughs> you, are, you are doing TV for that. I mean, how how is calling TV different than radio, the usual medium of radio? Yeah, it's a little different. And uh, I think anyone who listened to some of the or watched some of the first few matches would have recognized that. So, again, it takes a little you know, takes a little uh, compassion to, for in my early days when I start something else, I've called some TV in the past, but not a lot. And it's been a long time. Uh, it's great because it's, it's new, it's a new skill, it's fun and it leverages skills and knowledge I've already developed elsewhere. So I, I think it's a ton of fun. I've got to figure out how to be more neutral because we're kind of coached. Hey, this is a national broadcast. But like, how do you not say kaboom? You know, how do you how do you not say, hey, the, the other team is suddenly passing worse than a moped on I-80? I mean, you got, you got to have some fun here. And, uh, you know, you got to do it at somebody's expense. But everyone's supposed to be objective and neutral. Uh, so it's I got to channel Nebraska. <laughs> I know, it's like News Channel Nebraska. And so I, you'd think that I'm supposed to be a little bit part. I, hopefully they'll be a little forgiving. I think it's more fun. I got to tell you, I mean, listen to a 
listen to a local broadcast with a couple of homers um, versus a national national broadcast. I think it's a different vibe, you know. And uh, mm-hmm. um, I'll I I've got a ways to go in that department, but um, it's it's tough not to be attached to the team either because they're just they're great young women. There's a after match party after Saturday night's win over twelve, you know, in front of twelve thousand fans. And man, these 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 players are just mature. I had my son with me and they're all saying hello. And, and they acted like they were just anybody, whether, you know, they were selling tickets or, or, you know, the best player on the team, you know, one of the best players on the team, Brooke Nunnerville, just kind as can be ready to chat. And Sydney Hill is just sitting there talking with everybody. I just, it's, it's typifies the sport where, you know, they, they don't view themselves as big shot celebrities. They're, they're, grateful they're they love what they do and they want to bring people in it's not this you know hey um we've got this kind of a relationship looking down at others it's it's really nice to be part of uh, something where there's so much mutual respect seemingly among everyone participating especially the fans the voice of nebraska volleyball john baylor john thank you so much for being with us today and we promise we won't go 20 more episodes before bringing you back on we'll, we'll find a time to touch base this fall maybe to, to set up the the husker season i've faced rejection before i remember junior prom but uh um this has been great and um i'm happy to come back anytime but uh um thank you guys for having me yeah we appreciate it very much thank you thanks john appreciate it all right, John Baylor, thank you so much for being with us on Volleyball State. I want to switch gears a little bit, just slightly, Lincoln. You mentioned uh, being up at the Supernovas match on Saturday, uh, Supernovas 1-4. and four. That was actually my first trip up to CHI Health Center. I went up with my family um, and got to watch the, the show. And I was kind of trying to evaluate it from both you know, a fan experience perspective uh, as well as a, a, a level of play perspective omaha won the match they're now eight and four which moved them into to second place in the pro volleyball federation although we are taping this on a tuesday by the time that you hear this next week um the atlanta vibe will have played two more matches they're at eight and three right now leading the the pvf standing so they could either have fallen back behind omaha or or stretch their lead out a little bit omaha's next match is not going to be until march 28th so on a thursday they're going to play grand rapids but um you know, you you've been up to several Supernovas matches. Let's let's start with level of play, I guess. What's been your impressions on on how the Supernovas have been put together and, and how they're playing right now? Yeah, it's definitely exciting. As, as kind of John was talking about a little bit earlier, it is an elevated level of play than what most people are used to seeing at the college level. Um, I mean, I, the thing that I've kind of noticed, too, is like it's the defense that really surprises me that I mean, they got some big hitters on both sides of the net and their ability to pass and dig a lot of the attacks is just, it's impressive. It's, it's, it's elite level. Whereas I, I feel like almost more kills come out of roll shots or tip shots or kind of the junk shots you think of, because that's what the defense isn't expecting. They're expecting the hitters to, to bomb away. So uh, mm-hmm. it's been really, it's been really fun to watch them kind of even from that first big night in January where they had the opening night to now um, just kind of the chemistry develop. You see uh, Omaha has used two different setters too in Sydney Hilly and uh, <clears throat> Valentin Anderson and, mm-hmm. uh, um, and just kind of the different things that they bring. And uh, there's a lot of impressive players that they're figuring out how to work together. So it's, mm-hmm. it, it's impressive. And I think it's definitely a step up from what we've seen at the collegiate level. Yeah. I, well, and I've noticed, you know, kind of the same thing you have about long rallies and the defense. And there's certainly some really good liberos in this league. I mean, Kendall white is a, is a really good libero, former Penn state libero that starts for, for Omaha. One thing I think is kind of missing from this league is those elite attackers, those elite pin hitters that can put a ball down kind of on a B minus set. Cause I noticed a lot of rallies on, on Saturday, we're, we're getting a lot of long rallies, but it's like, man, that was a decent set that, that they were in system. Somebody has got to put a ball away. And I think some of the reasons why we're seeing longer rallies is just like the level of attacking isn't quite at a, you know, an international elite level. No one's going to confuse right now, the pro volleyball federation with like, the Italian league or the the German yeah. league, the best leagues in the world that have those Olympic level pin hitters. And I, th- I just think that's the next thing that's missing from a professional league in the U S is, is someone who can just take, take balls and put it away. I, I, I don't think that 
this league is is peppered with those kinds of players yet. But also, you know, that's a credit to tough serving and, um, you know, the quality of block setup and the quality of coaching you see. It just seemed like the match I saw on Saturday were a ton of long rallies. And I think I, I admittedly couldn't stay for the whole match. We left because we had two young kids with us. Um, just before game four started. And I guess that Betty De La Cruz really heated up there at the end. But um, that's one thing I'm, I'm kind of looking for next from this league is, is some high level outside hitters or opposites that can just absolutely go over the top of block or, or put balls down with some heat. Yeah. It's interesting to see the level of hitters that the type of hitters that are excelling are kind of maybe the undersized super athletic hitters like the Brooke Nunnevillers, uh, the Jill Gillian. Our girl Jill Gill was on there yeah, up in Omaha hit. last week. Very popular. Leah Edmond for Atlanta. Claire Chasse plays for Grand Rapids, former Louisville star too. I mean, they're all kind of, I mean, they're slightly undersized, but they're just the most, usually the most athletic players on the floor and just kind of use their supreme jumping skills to hit powerfully mm. and just kind of stay involved in it. So it's, it's interesting to see that kind of player develop, but then uh, Omaha maybe, maybe found something that Nia Reed, she's been um, kind of getting a little bit more playing time the last couple of matches too. And uh, you need to see that level of, of play from that position at the opposite. From, from like a production and fan experience perspective, you know, obviously I have not been to any other pro volleyball federation markets. I feel like the supernovas have really hit on something. Um, they, they've got a great arena. They've got it set up really well. The in-game production is, is awesome. And I'm not just saying that because we're on a herd at show right now, but you know, th this doesn't look like a, a minor league. This doesn't look like a startup production. And, you know, I think they're still working out who their TV, the league's TV partners are going to be. But anytime you can get 12,000 people to a, a volleyball match, like you're doing something right in the promotion, the partnership sense. I don't know this is this is all just because Nebraska is a, a volleyball crazy state. But, you know, the groundwork was really well laid, I think, for this franchise. Locally, they've got a lot of local partners. You know, I took my two year old around. We're walking through the fan zone, seeing like there's face painting and balloon animals and all this stuff that you kind of need to be a family friendly uh, sporting event. And what's it look like kind of from your seat in the in the in the press section about the production and the in-game experience that people yeah. have? And, I, and just again, I have also only been in person to Omaha matches, too. And I think Omaha is on a different plane and just talking to some people, too, about what they see at other arenas. Mm -hmm. uh, Omaha is doing it well and hopefully setting a standard that other other teams and franchises can emulate. Um, and I don't know that's just because of, like you said, a lot of the people have experience with Nebraska volleyball or the NCAA tournament in Omaha. So I think mm -hmm. they did a good job. It's a great hiring. market yeah. is what it is. And sure. I think there's some other, you know, I don't know how many lessons some of these other markets are going to even be able to learn from Omaha, because I think Omaha is really the, the success story of this league. And I hope that the league endures for several years to, to for other markets to find their own success stories. But, you know, Omaha is clearly the, I think, the standout when you're able to draw, you know, multiple five figure crowds and some other franchises are maybe drawn three or four thousand um, which in any other part of the world is honestly a pretty good crowd for a yeah. professional women's volleyball match. I, I, you know, I tweeted on Saturday, you have some of the best leagues in the world that are drawn 2,500 or 3,000 fans to regular season matches. They would kill for an environment like this, even if the quality of play is a little different. Yeah, and Omaha does have one of the bigger arenas that they're using. I mean, some of the arenas only fit five to 8,000 people. So they're, they're kind of a, is a, cap on that too so mm -hmm. the one thing that it, it stuck out to me uh about how omaha is doing it right at the post one of the post game press conferences this past week one of the uh coaches came in it's like you put stats out for me at the uh, table thank you for doing that apparently that's not <laughs> common practice all the time is to give the uh coaches stats before they go talk to the media so mm -hmm. um it, it's, it's those little things that just kind of make a difference yeah. and make you look like a grown-up league and uh, a real business operation. No, no stats, just vibes. Omaha's next match is Thursday, March 28th at the CHI Health Center. They're playing Grand Rapids. Uh, you want to move into Husker stuff now? Yes. So the big news in Nebraska, uh, two things happened. We'll kind of talk about uh, beach season just ended, but looking forward, indoor season where Nebraska uh, excels and puts a lot more of their resources, they will be playing their spring match uh, just recently and changed. No longer at Kearney High School will now be on the campus of UNK. They're going to be taking on the Denver Pioneers on May 4th. I believe it's two o'clock start. 
in the afternoon. I don't have it right in front of me, but yeah, UN, UNK's venue is uh, is a little bit bigger. I think they can fit about thousand. It five thousand. Five thousand. Wow. Okay. Well, they're gonna they're gonna draw great there Saturday, May fourth, which is the Saturday after Nebraska spring football game. They're gonna play Denver. Um, Denver's head Denver's a Summit League team. It was tied. It, we're in. A, they were in a four way tie for the Summit League championship with UNO and a couple other schools. I think UMKC was in there as well. Mm-hmm. But the the big tie to Nebraska is uh, coached by former Husker Megan Pendergast, who started her career at Nebraska and then, like everyone else, transferred to Texas A and M midway through her career. Uh, Denver went 14 and 12 last season, 2023, and uh, fell just short of a, an NCAA tournament bid because they actually lost to UNO in the Summit League tournament. But that's going to be a, a really fun experience. Denver was sort of one of the, I, it, it didn't occur to me that they could be a possibility, but now looking back, I was saying like Colorado, Colorado State. Well, Denver's right there in the yeah. same and has- area, and you have to be within a few hundred miles drive. Yeah, and it tied to Nebraska too. I remember back in my days, I was uh, the second reporter for the Lincoln Journal Star at the helping out the postseason. Uh, Megan Pendergast would get always get in that uh, first weekend games the NCAA tournament. So I think I wrote a couple of uh, sidebar stories about her, and, and mm-hmm. she's been rising up the coaching ranks. She was an assistant, I believe, uh, at UCLA. Um, I think it, she had Texas A and M as well too, or. She was an assistant, a couple assistant jobs before yeah. she. This is her first long time assistant, job. and this is her. This is gonna be her second year um, this year as the as the head coach at Denver. So it's always good to see former Husker uh, make good. Any any health situations that we need to be aware of before then? Is everyone probably going to play? Yeah, so I know a couple of players out of beach season. Becca Alec didn't play. I think that was just more of a rest and recovery. I mean, she plays a very physical style of volleyball. I don't think. I think they're just like. Let's take it easy. Kennedy or they just wanted to make sure, save her knee. Um, she had a thing a couple of years ago where she just, I don't know, just land on that. But So they're playing it more yeah, safe than anything she else. She her knee up her senior year of high school. Yeah, and Kennedy they had or. a little tweak, a little, little oh, okay. cleanup procedure her after her freshman indoor season, so she missed that year. Um, so the other, I don't know, minor, minor injury, Merritt Beeson missed the last couple of days of beach season. She apparently stepped on a rock in the ocean and had to get a couple of stitches. She'll be fine. You know, um, I keep waiting for someone to get like stung by a jellyfish or like, <laughs> you know, a, attacked by a manta ray or something when they go out to Hawaii. Yeah. But luckily, so, we yeah, Nebraska, so Nebraska did end up that wrap up their beach season last week. Um, they had played a couple home weekend matches, went down to LSU, got to play in a cool environment down there, played the LSU Tigers under the lights, uh, went out to Hawaii for their annual trip, and then ended up with a little California swing, played Texas and Long Beach State to wrap up uh, the season. Uh, last Lost the last four matches, but did finish 16-11, which is the most uh, wins for a Nebraska beach program. Um, I mean, they, they beat everyone they should have beat, didn't really have any – knock off any like pure beach teams i think um and all the schools you've heard of for the most part they lost to or you you were mm-hmm. aware that they're major division one institution nebraska lost to them yeah um so i don't but know how much to take out of it a good cross training yeah so Th- this brings to an end the the nebraska volleyball career of ali Beatenhorst, who is gonna once she's uh done this semester in may is going to transfer to usc um, also for the indoor match, you know, you, you don't have uh, transfers. Taylor Landfair, who's going to be here um, this summer, and then also the, the the middle blocker from San Diego, whose name is suddenly uh, Layla Blackwell, uh, whose name is suddenly blanking. I, I, it came to me. I'm not. I'm not. My memory is not completely gone yet. So those players won't be available for the spring match. They will be on Nebraska's roster uh, this yeah. summer. The the two incoming freshmen are there. Um, Freshman Skyler outside hitter Skyler Pierce is here, played pretty well, and uh, defensive specialist Libero Olivia Mack is also playing there. Also, I, I when I, while we're talking about beach, one of the cool stories I wrote a story on Huskers Illustrated. Go read about this. Um, Kayla Kinney, because they were kind of fl- in flux with their roster movement, everyone leaving, their transfers aren't coming in. They needed an extra person. Kayla Kinney came in off of the UNL club team and. Was largely played the exhibition matches, but she did play in two varsity matches. Went two and zero, so she went undefeated. Uh, just kind of a really cool story about how uh, she has some uh, prep club connections through 
Uh, Lexi Rodriguez also went to high school with women's basketball mm-hmm. player Kendall Moriarty. So really cool story. Go we'll, go read my story on Huskers Illustrated to get more of the background and hear from her. But kind of a, a fun fun little thread in mm-hmm. the world of volleyball, going from playing club club team to varsity mm-hmm. Husker beach team. Absolutely. Yeah. Go read that story at Huskers Illustrated. And, um, you know, the, the elephant in the room in the Nebraska athletic department is that Trev Alberts announced, uh, he didn't really announce it. It, he announced it came out sooner than I think he wanted to, but he is no longer the athletic director at Nebraska. He has left for Texas A&M and we don't have to spend a ton of time on this because there's every Nebraska sports radio podcast journalist has had their piece on this already. Um, the impact on volleyball though, of, of Nebraska getting a new athletic director, it seems like the last couple of vacancies we've had at this position when an interim athletic director is going to be hired, everyone throws out John Cook's name as the potential interim athletic director. Once again, that's not happening this time. Um, longtime athletic department staffer, Dennis LeBlanc, who's in charge of the academic side of the athletic department and, and well-liked and well-respected almost to a person in Nebraska athletics has, has earned that interim spot. But, um, you know, I I never think it's a good idea every time I hear it come up for John Cook to be the interim athletic director because that's taking someone who's really good at running one program and taking them away from that and asking them to then manage like 18 programs. And it, it just yeah. never like lands right with me that people jump up and say like, well, this is obviously what we should do. Yeah. He's a very successful coach. Why can't he? I mean, it's kind of the old model of the athletic department, like the Devaney yeah. model where, hey, you are a longtime successful coach. You're just naturally going to transition into administration. But I think that's where, I mean, John Cook is kind of a CEO coach. Um, that why can't he be a CEO athletic director? But I, yeah, I think that everyone was throwing Cook's name out. That will not be happening. Um, it did kind of force me to just people are at. So I finally wrote down my, when John Cook does step aside, I have, I now have my article written about who, the, who's on the list of uh, potential replacements. So I have my horn ready. To we should do whenever. that for an off season show. That's one thing we should, we should bring Baylor back for that. That's something, you know, we've <laughs> all talked with John about like 15 times. Um, it, the, the analogy with moving, you know, John Cook up into the interim athletic department role, even if he was interested in it, which I don't know that he is, is the old, like, you, know, you take your best salesperson and you promote them into being the sales manager, which takes them away from the thing they're really good at and, and makes them kind of learn a new position. Yeah. Like, I'm always the fan of go hire someone who's done this job well at a different school and ask them to do the job well at this school. Like, I don't know why we yeah. have to be too clever by half when trying to solve these things. And I hope that that's not what you know for Nebraska's athletic sake, I hope that's not what they're going to try to do um, this time around and, and filling some some important key vacancies that are happening. Yeah. But but John Cook will, you know, as far as we can tell, continue to coach Nebraska volleyball and continue coaching it at a fairly high level for as long as he yeah. wants to do it. And I think we should give Trev out. Trev Alvarez was a large part of making volleyball day in Nebraska happen too. I mean, the institutional support he gave the volleyball program and belief that he kind of to 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 work with John Cook and say, let's do this. We're going to happen. A lot, a lot of athletic directors are doing that. And so I think flowers to Trev for, for that part, mm-hmm. at least. And you can disagree with his exit mode, whatever, but he was an asset to the volleyball program and gave them resources that they needed to continue being a juggernaut of a program. Absolutely. Well, that for the most part is our show today. But however, Lincoln created an online stir uh, earlier this week when he's posting pictures of some of our merch through Hurt at Sports, especially our Justice for Liberos t-shirt, which, you know, it's going to be the new Stanley Cup. It's going to be the new hot thing to fly off the shelves that you got to get for Mother's Day or Christmas or Valentine's Day. Emily Eamon said that um, she's going to wear the shirt that you sent her like under her clothes pretty much every day. And she's going to get, she got some FaceTime in the big 10 basketball tournament. I don't know if she's doing anything for the NCAA tournament, but we got to, we got to keep spreading the brand. We got to get that out there. I wore my um, bald set spike shirt to uh, the supernovas match on Saturday, which you and me might be the only people that are actually interested in that shirt. I don't care. Like I want it in every color because it it fits what I'm about, but um, you want to check out merch from the show that helps support the show. It, 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 brings you into the community and tells people that you know ball that's all we're talking about these days is yeah. who knows ball who doesn't know ball we're talking about volleyball go to herdatsports.com slash shop and you can find all your great volleyball state merch there's t-shirts there's beanies i forget yeah. what all we have but like we're we're blowing it out hat on for the for the libero in your life 
get the hashtag justice for liberos t-shirt and uh it'll it'll be to you in like three to five business days yeah so support the program support the community we're here to uh, we're, we're here to grow the grow the brand but also uh let people know that you're into volleyball yeah. too like we are and in case you don't want to bolt has got a wedding you got, he needs to pay to. for so like every yeah. shirt you order like helps lincoln pay for one dinner at his upcoming nuptials Thank you. Yes, for that, indeed. So if you want to interact with us, uh, otherwise, not just buy the merch, uh, you can tw- tweet at us at Volleyball Pod. Uh, again, email us at volleyballstate at gmail.com. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Lincoln underscore VB. Feel free to read all my articles at Huskers Illustrated, and I will probably get some Volleyball Mag articles coming up this season. But I'm already starting to worry about uh, fall previews, so... It's a, it's well, you know, you've got, you've got four or five months. It's not not that bad. Maybe we're not a 12-month sport yet. Um, yeah, where, you worry about that when you, you come back from your honeymoon. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at by Jeff Sheldon. That's B-Y Jeff Sheldon. Thanks so much to Cam Broham for producing today's show. We've already kind of overshot our time, so we got to let Cam go. Thanks so much to Hurt At Sports. Follow us uh, at follow Hurt At Sports on social media and on YouTube, where you can see our smiling, shiny faces uh, for today's show and for all the shows in the foreseeable future. Thank you so much for listening, and we will be back next time on Volleyball State.